and that covers color, clarity, and a thing called specific gravity. And there's some good pictures in the book I'm going to put on the Elmo. Then we're also going to do chemical. It takes two minutes to read, but you'll see when you have to know the, re the key reaction of each chemical pad and the disease states and the factors that are, uh, can make it a false negative or a false positive. There's a lot to each little bitty pad. And then you'll see the importance of a UA with more than just a urinary tract infection. Okay, so the chemical is going to have, why don't someone read them to me in the order starting with glucose. Hold your bottle up. You always hold your bottles like this, and you always start like this. Glucose should be at your top. So today when you're reading your dipstick, this is how you hold your bottle. The strip will go along the edge by all the negatives. Okay, like this. You hold it like this, and the strip will be here, and you'll line up the, the little green dipstick. When, we get it, when I pass out the dipsticks, you'll see. Okay, so read them off, starting with glucose and working your way up. What's after glucose? Bilirubin. Bilirubin. Now, is glucose 30 seconds? Yeah. yeah. Is bilirubin 30? Yeah. yeah. Okay, then what's the next one? Ketone. Ketones, is that the 40 or 45? 40. 40. And then what's after that? S gravity. Yeah. And we're going to do two ways of specific gravity. And what's that one? 45? Five. And now are the 560s? Yep. Okay, so what's the first one? Blood. Blood. And then what else? pH. Protein. Protein. Urobilinogen. Urobilinogen. And nitrate. And then leukocytes? Nitrite. Nitrites and then leukocytes? Yeah. Okay, leukocytes is how many minutes? Two. Two. That's a big deal. Okay, so these five were 60 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. So when we pass out the dipsticks, I'm going to show you how to hold one. And then you actually rotate this strip with as you rotate the bottle and you line up the pads. Remember, I'm going to show you which ones have a number. We'll, we'll star those or circle those. You'll always have a number for specific gravity and you'll always have a number for pH. And pH will always be between usually 5 and 8. The book says normal is like 4.5 to 8, but I don't know if I've ever called a urine at 4 or 5. Specific gravity and we'll, we'll give a little brief synopsis and then we'll have a lecture on all of this. Specific gravity starts with always 1.0. We're measuring dissolved solids in our urine. We want to know if glucose is in there, it's going to be a high specific gravity because it's a big, heavy molecule. If you have maybe a normal specific gravity, we'll have middle of the road, just your normal metabolites from your body's metabolism. If you are someone who has excessive water going out in their urine, you're going to have a very low specific gravity. You won't have as many dissolved solids. It's too dilute with the water. It always starts with 1.0. So if I have a very dilute, someone who has a ton of water, I'm going to be closer to like three, two, or one. And how I would write three is like this. If I am someone who has a ton of glucose, I'm a diabetic that's uncontrolled, I might have a lot of heavy glucose. I might have 30. So these are the two numbers that change. 1.0 never changed. And you might as well pass those out too. That's what you're going to need the water for. Let's see, hopefully there's ones in here. And you're going to, I want you, no, there's one not in there. 
I want you to use different types today. I'm going to pass that one across and keep this one. It's 1.0. No, above 35 is abnormal, so I've never seen a 90 or a 99. If someone has x-ray graph, like die from a, maybe a MRI, yeah, and try to do that one. Sorry. Okay. You guys get one, do your name. No. We'll try. So I wonder where the one, I'm not sure if this. Let's see. It says you are seeing. We'll try that one. So we have an extra one we'll try if one doesn't work right. So these are called refractometers. And and we'll get a lecture on this, but it measures dissolved solids in a urine and how they refract or divert through when they're comparing it to light shining through. So if you have a lot of heavy particles, it's gonna refract or divert more than if you have nothing in your urine. And so that is one method. The specific gravity on your dipstick is another method. This week we'll do the refractometer. After this week, you always can just use the dipstick specific gravity, okay? Then the chemical pads, we'll have a whole lecture on what disease they go with, what can cause a false negative, what can cause a false positive. Um, but a brief synopsis, glucose and ketones are something in association with diabetes. Did you talk with Barb already on some glucose things? I think your lab tomorrow is, or was it today with the bagels? tomorrow with doing blood glucoses. Mm -hmm. If you're an uncontrolled diabetic, you can have glucose spillover, but if you're very out of control, your body will break down fats and completely if it doesn't have enough glucose to go to, and they're called ketones. So they go hand in hand with diabetes. Do you know which diabetes that is when it's involving sugar? Mellitus. So diabetes mellitus is when it's involving glucose. Anybody know what the diabetes is when it's involving too much water is being excreted instead of reabsorbed? It's called diabetes insipidus. So you're gonna have to know as we evolve, what would we see as the lab results to distinguish them? So that's down the road. Uh, specific gravity, if it's diabetes, and that's a good example. If it's diabetes insipidus and I have a ton of water I'm excreting, instead of pulling it back into my bloodstream, it will have a low specific gravity. So if I gave you a case study of 1.030, it's not going to go with diabetes insipidus. But if I have an uncontrolled diabetic, and their glucose is spilling in their urine and glucose is heavy, the specific gravity might be 30. And if I gave you a case study with a high specific gravity and I told you the diabetic was not taking their medicine, you would expect a high specific gravity, maybe glucose in the urine and ketones in the urine. So that from the get-go, try to think of what it could mean for the patient. You, that's sometimes the only fact you have is what lab results are. You need to think every time you have a lab result what it means. Uh, blood, sometimes just someone even with a UTI can have blood in their urine a little bit. Uh, sometimes near or after a period. We know women who are childbearing age can have bloody urines because they're on their period. But you could have before and after your period some blood that shows up trace. Um, blood a lot of times though on a male or when like someone like me who is in menopause, you know, over 50, you would worry about blood in your urine. You'd be thinking, well shoot, is there something going on with my kidney structure? 
before. Did I have trauma? Maybe I ran a marathon. Maybe I was in a car accident with abdominal or back trauma someplace to my midsection. Blood doesn't always mean bad. With Diane, you learned about hemolytic anemias. Our dipstick, look at the blood. Does it only do intact or fresh blood cells? Or does it also do hemoglobin? What does it say? Isn't there a speckled one versus a, a solid color? Yeah, Non-hemolyzed means it's fresh blood. If it's hemolyzed, it can detect the hemoglobin. So if you had a hemolytic anemia, you could be seeing blood show up in your urinalysis from the hemoglobin. Okay? Um, protein. pH, the only way I really use pH as a case study is if it's a fresh urine and it smells putrid or foul, and I know they just voided, first thing I think, I bet they're going to have a high pH and I bet they have a urinary tract infection. They produce ammonia as the bacteria multiply, which increases the pH. Today you'll see all of us, unless we, some of us may be on the verge of a UTI, should have an acid pH, something under 7 or at the most 7. That's really the only time I worry about pH is I know it's a fresh urine and I know it's at 8 and it smells awful. Urine is aromatic. If you open a urine that there's no disease process going on and it hasn't sat forever out at room temp like 8 hours, it shouldn't smell. That's what we mean by aromatic. The first time, I mean, I get it off. We had little elevators called dumbwaiter. You get it, open that lid, and you want to close that lid up immediately, you are thinking UTI. Because normally, they don't have a smell. You can walk in the room with everybody's urine open, and it shouldn't smell bad if they don't have a disease state going on. Sometimes diabetics who are uncontrolled might have a fruity smell, a sweet smell to their urine. There's one disease I'll teach you about called an amino aciduria called a branch chain. It's called maple syrup sugar disease, and the urine actually smells like maple syrup. And they have their leucine, valine, and isoleucine, their amino acids are improperly metabolized, and they have a maple syrup smell. So normally, urine smell is not anything that you have to report. It just gives you a clue when you're working on it, what you might expect if it ha has a bad smell to it. Protein, a general indicator, all of us can have a little bit of protein. Just by walking around being, they call that orthostatic proteinuria. If we're walking around, you might have some spillage and it might be trace. You still have to confirm anything trace or more, which that'll be our third part of the UA. but it's usually not anything bad. It's just your habits of being up and about. Yes? Sometimes, not necessarily, sometimes you might, if any, I know color changes. Anybody take vitamins regularly? It is like a glowing yellow in the toilet when you take vitamins regularly. There might be something in your diet that makes it smell, I can tell the smell being, after being on antibiotic in the, in, it's just, so I think everybody might smell from their diet. If they ate something on a regular basis, it might, but not necessarily anything bad. But it's more concentrated in the morning if you've not voided. You know, I might get up two times in the middle of the night, so mine's not going to be concentrated like someone who goes eight hours and doesn't get up. You know, so. Right. And the other thing, who knows? A lot of elderly people are on 50 million different medicines. Mm -hmm. So you, who knows how that would affect your smell of your urine as well, what you eat. Um, so. Protein, I always think, if I get two plus or higher, and you'll see even on the, if you look at your jar, some of them say pluses, some of them say numbers. 
you're going to see it done both ways at clinicals. You just have to adapt to their way. I want you to report the numbers for me, not the pluses. If you get two plus or higher, which is that 100 milligrams, that should be significant and you should look at their kidney function. It, and we're going to talk about the nephron in our lecture when we get together tomorrow. The pieces that could be having a problem if you have protein spillage. Okay? Always think. Now, if someone has a UTI, anytime you have cells present or bacteria, they're made of protein, you can have some high protein. Um, when you get to nitrites and leukocytes, they go hand in hand for a UTI. And one thing you'll learn something in UA, and then you'll learn in micro. Gram negative bacteria like E. coli, they're the pink bacilli, if you had that in micro, I mean in your anatomy. They like nitrates in your diet. So they convert nitrates to nitrites and spill into your urine and it'll turn the pad a real pretty pink. So the doctor knows it's a gram negative bacteria that had produced nitrites a lot of times they don't even culture it. They just automatically give them the regimen. E. coli is 80% of your UTIs on a normal person. Not necessarily like a elderly at a nursing home patient, but your normal people like us, 80% would be caused by E. coli. So if they get a pink box on that nitrite, many times they'll just treat you with something that works on a gram-negative bacteria. But if you have a gram-positive bacteria, and one you'll learn in microbiology is something called enterococcus. And it's a, it's a bad one, because it can become very resistant to an antibiotic called vancomycin. It will be negative on your dipstick. So a question you like to see on the registry that we've seen there, and I give it to you on a test, why did the patient have a UTI when their nitrite was negative? And you, all you got to say is because it was a gram-positive bacteria. They do not convert nitrates that are in your diet to nitrite. They don't. The E. coli, the gram-negatives, can convert nitrates to nitrite. So yes, the question could be, can you have a UTI if your nitrite is negative? Yes because it can be a gram-positive bacteria. So we'll review this again when we get to micro, because you'll learn about E. coli and its family, and you'll learn about Enterococcus and its family. So you should be already starting to see how a lot of connections go between departments. That a lot of times, the more you're knowledgeable about all the departments, the better you take care of your patients, because you get the whole picture. You see how it all relates. Um, and then leukocyte, we had a policy if any ER urine had eight leukocytes per high power field. So we only look at 10 and 40 when we do urine microscopics. You don't do oil. If there were eight or more, we, it reflexed to a urine culture, even if there was no bacteria present. So a lot of physicians feel, if you have a lot of white cells, you are fighting a bacterial infection. Most places like to use them in conjunction, the nitrite and the leukocyte. So without getting our lecture, that's kind of why. You don't just do a urine just to see if you have a urinary tract infection. The last two I left out was bilirubin and urobilinogen. Urobilinogen is another number one. Look at your bottle. What does urobilinogen what does urobilinogen, how do you report it if it's normal? There's two ways. 0.2 or 1.0. Both of them are considered normal. Do you remember the other two that you got to report a number? pH, pH and specific gravity. Okay. You've got to figure out how, you know those three, you have to write a number down. When you're doing your negatives, I don't care if you do dashes for negative. I don't care if you do N for negative, or I don't care if you do NEG. All three work. You can decide what helps you. If it's faster for you to do dashes, but remember, 
you only need to remember the positives and the number. The rest of them are going to be negative. So don't worry about, oh my gosh, how many were negative? Just remember the positives and the three that need a number. Most urines are going to be acid, so most of the numbers you're going to have to remember for pH are between 5 and 7. And uh, if you'll notice, they're up in halves. I think it goes 5.5, 6, 6.5. Okay, so let me show you. We're going we're gonna to do the dipstick and we're going to do the physical and clear, the color and clarity first. We're going to end with the refractometer on these four. Okay? Because you get a specific gravity on this. Um, so I'm going to come around. You're going to have eight urine. So pass. You want to try it, and we need blank test tubes. This worked because we were having all the leukocytes contaminated. Everybody take one per person, and we're going to put your 10 dipsticks for each person in there. Okay? And, and just, you don't have to label them, we'll just keep them blank because we're just putting our dipsticks. What we found when we would store them in the old containers, the leukocytes were all turning purple. And that's the positive color. So everybody was getting high leukocytes and under the microscope there were nothing. Okay, so take, take 10 each and put them in, there to Sean, and put them in your blank test tube. And then I'll show you how to dip a urine and hold it. And uh, you guys will work it out. And you, you each physically have to do all four controls. Not like, okay, you do this one and I'll write it down too. You're only going to get better if you do the reading. You know, most of us do better if we do it and not watch someone do it. Yes? We're going to get to that. Yeah, because we're going to start with color and clarity. And what we'll try to do is as we go around the room, if we get what I consider a clear, a hazy, a cloudy, a turbid, some of you might have some you can't see through because you had them refrigerated. A lot of times your dissolved solids precipitate out. So when we get done with the color and clarity, these are on our own urines. These are controls, so we're not gonna we're not gonna line them up. We'll kind of go through if we see a real cloudy one. But on our patients, every day when we're done, we'll try to line them up if we see a clear versus a hazy versus a cloudy. Oh, does someone have the, bo the bottle going around? Okay, you can pass it over here when you're done. They didn't have as many in that jar. I know today is long, but to, you'll see how fast the labs we do them after today's. I think it's worth spending time up front on the first day, then I think you understand it better the next days. Okay? And let me get my page out too. And uh, what we'll do, what was one of the page 98? Yeah. Uh, no. Do you guys have a look? No. And make sure you are using blue or black pen. And if you make a mistake, a single line through it. And your initials. Which I don't see that I have a pen at all. Okay. Okay. So we're going to do, I'm going to show you K1. And color, you'll see, has, when we get to the lecture, it's made up of, uh, normal color is all sorts of yellow. If you drink a lot of water and you've had a lot, it's going to be very pale yellow, even maybe what is called colorless. We had a term called straw. So if I had a very light yellow, I would call it straw. Someone in the next lab might call it light yellow. I, on practicals, do not grade color unless there's a color that was definitely distinct and you missed it. If someone is on an antibiotic called pyridium for UTI, it sometimes will turn them orange. 
So if I put an orange urine on a practical and you called it dark yellow, that would be wrong. But if I put a, a very yellow one on there and you say it's light yellow, you say it's pale yellow, you'll say it's straw. Oh no, you say it's yellow. I'm not going to mark that wrong on anybody. It's very subjective, I feel, unless it's distinct. Um, a danger that we all worried about is if we see a dark yellow on a fresh urine that wasn't necessarily their first morning, then I'm going to be thinking liver and possibly hepatitis. So when it starts getting dark yellow to brown in the lab, we were going to be a little bit more cautious because that was our first thought. They might have something going on with their liver. And when we talk about the analytes, bilirubin is something you'll get with Barb on the chemistry side and you'll get with us on the urine side. Okay? So look at the list of all colors you can have. It's, it's crazy. There's so many colors you can have. You can have yellow to amber to orange and something not pathological would be bilirubin. Look at everything that's non-pathological that could cause that color. Okay? You get a yellow to green, bilirubin will break down to biliburden. Remember when I said something about bilirubin, you expose it to light? That's why you, got, you can't let them sit too long. If it's there, it'll be gone and it goes to biliburden, which you don't detect on a dipstick. Is that the one they put in the gloves so it won't stay out, stay from yeah, the light? Yeah, sometimes they will or they'll put them in a uh, foil. They'll put foil around the urine. But look, these are all the pathological causes and oh, I guess they don't have any yellow to green non-pathological. So that tells you right there, you get a yellow to green. And honestly, our Billy Rubens, I'd say I saw a more very dark yellow to what a, a, a color we call amber, almost going to the brown side, than I saw yellow to green. If it's getting to be green the way the book reads, then you know it's been converted to Billy Burden and it may not be detected well on your dipstick. So that's Billy Rubin. Look at all the pink to reds. Hemoglobin, myoglobin, the porphyrias. Did you talk at all about lead poisoning as one of your anemias where the delta amino lebulinic acid, that is something we'll discuss when we get to amino acidurias as a porphyria, and that would be detected on a dipstick too. But look at all the non-pathological causes, beets, different drugs can call that red, cause that reddish color. So we're going to key into key ones that go with a specific disease. Because as you see in the book, there's a ton of non-pathological causes. Um, red to purple, purple, when you have a porphyria, like if you have lead poisoning, that's considered a porphyria. One of the colors they say your urine turns when it stands is port red wine. It looks like as it stands, it's not a fresh urine, but the longer it stands, and that's a clue. And that's a registry question clue. You see port red wine urine, you should be thinking porphyria, like lead poisoning. Sometimes if you only remember key facts, almost like a trivia, <laughs> you only remember that key little fact, you're going to get the question right. Uh, Red-brown can be forms of hemoglobin. Brown to black, we're going to talk about amino acid problems with melanin, with uh, a term uh, with tyrosine phenylalanine pathway, another one with uh, an endocinuria with the endocin pathway. So some of these colors go with amino acid problems. But look again, look at all these drugs that can also give the, the color. So I don't grade color hard on practicals because there's a lot of non-pathological reasons. Today, it looks like most of ours are some form of yellow. These would be a darker yellow. And can you at least say, see that this one isn't as clear as this one? To me, this would be an example of hazy and cloudy. Turbid is when you can't see your hand behind it. You couldn't see any writing. And usually that's not pathological. It means you got to put it in the refrigerator warm, then it came out cold and all the, your dissolved solids precipitated out. It's usually nothing bad for you.
cloudy is the one you worry about on a fresh urine. First thing I think on a cloudy, there's cells in there or there's bacteria. Hazy is so common for women because we have mucus cycle. And so uh, they even list in the book like talcum powder, different lotions, why your, why your urine may not be clear. So the normal, anybody have one that looks really, really clear? This is pretty clear. And hazy is tough. You, some people would call both of these clear and this one cloudy. The other thing, you never read, uh, never read from your jar. You always do it from the tube. And what do you think you need to, should you touch your tubes all like this? What if you were using powdery gloves? Then you're going to have all that on the tube. So hold your tubes at the top, kind of like the specs. Make sure you wipe them off with a Kim wipe before you judge the color. Uh, so don't worry so much. Uh, this one is, the, the. I'm sure this is level one for Kova. I would go with cloudy and we'll do level one Kova as clear. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. One of these is a patient. One of those. And let's see the MAS ones. These the front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now this one is everybody see that these almost look a darker gold or yellow, and this one. So I'm not going to say honestly if you called these both yellow, I wouldn't mark you wrong because I don't really see this as dark brown or brownish yellow. And this is a little paler, but I could probably go with yellow and maybe dark yellow, but even this yellow seems almost a little bit more gold to me. Um, so what I'm saying is, is we get some distinct differences, then we'll put them in a rack and let you see them. Uh, but don't sweat it if you call it light yellow, pale yellow, yellow, dark yellow. If you're going to call it dark yellow, these would be the two closest to being a dark yellow. This one, is, both of these, I would go with, this is almost like a gold because it looks kind of fluorescent. This is more of a dark yellow. Do you see that these are paler? I think this one looks lighter than this one. So this would be my straw or light yellow for me. This one I could go with a, a, a light yellow. Someone have a good yellow? Hold up, let me see if I can see. And we'll mix that one, that'll be a good turban. I, I mean, I think this is a little light and that's a little dark. So if we get one that I see looks like a really distinct good yellow, bottom line, don't sweat it. You don't have anything color here that I would mark you off anyway. So if you say dark yellow on the deeper ones that look gold today, and like that one would be a very pale one. That would be straw or, or light yellow. But uh, the other thing is clarity. Clarity is very tough. So you also want to make sure you have wiped off everything with a chem wipe before you see if it's clear or not. The level ones on COVA should be clearer the level three, I mean, the level three should be clear. The level ones are the abnormal. That should be more cloudy. On the MAS, are these the front two? I don't think either of these look bad. They look clear to me. So if you, when you're getting to your, I think, so the MAS, you can put clear. The COVA one, I would put cloudy. The COVA three, I would put clear. As we get to your patient ones, the next round, we'll go ahead and see if we have some more distinctions. I know Leah's, once we mix hers up, was yours in the refrigerator? Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised we don't have more turbid ones because the minute we put it in the refrigerator and bring it to room temp, you usually get them precipitate out and you sometimes can't see through the back of it. So we should be able to get some better clarities. Okay, so let me show you how we do a dipstick vineyard. We're going to work on the four controls. So you take your, when I say go, and I'll let you, I'm going to go at the six. So we put in the uh, Where's level one? No, I don't want level one. That's all the positives. I'm going to show you just to get the hang of holding in and everything. 
So I'll go with the seven. You tell me when it's 30 seconds, you rim it, make sure all the pads, and you come out and rim it. I have 30 seconds to get it to my bottle. No, like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you got 30 seconds to get it there. And I didn't dip it till the seven. So I want to line up my glucose, the blue to the blue. That's way you know you're holding your dipstick properly. Okay? So at the five, I'm going to read it. And if it's close to the shade, even though it doesn't match perfectly, that's a negative. And then my bilirubin is a negative. And then tell me when it is at 40. Is, yeah. Then you got to keep rolling it. I'll still go with negative. Uh, ketones. I'm already off. Okay, ketones. I would say, am I at 60? 55. 10. The blood was negative. The pH was closer to 7. The protein was negative. And the nitrites was negative. And... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> The urobalinogen was 0 0.2, the nitrite was negative, and then, but I, you got to remember your positives. So does anybody remember what my pH was? And anybody remember what my urobalinogen was? Anybody remember if I had anything else positive so far? So I had urobalinogen, pH, specific gravity. Anybody remember what I said for specific gravity? It was 10, 1.010. So the only thing I have left to worry about at the 7 is my leukocytes, and I see it hasn't changed at all. So only remember what is positive. Everything else is going to get dash, 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 dash. So what is the worry? None of my negatives were going to become more positive. The worry is if you have a positive they get worse the longer you let it sit. So it was okay that it was off a little bit on my 560s. They were all negative. And my 0.2 urobilinogen didn't change. My, uh, your specific gravity shouldn't change because you only have so much dissolved solids in that urine. Okay, so the first round, do two controls, and then when you swap, see if you can read the other two by yourself. How about that? So watch the time for each other on the first two, and then when you, you swap with the table across from you, like you guys will swap with them, then let's see if you can read the last two controls by yourself watching the clock. Okay? And then we'll compare. So you guys, everybody has their own controls and everything. So this is yeah, K3. Uh, then we're going to do refractometers when everybody's done with their four urines. I think that'll be a more efficient way. Yes. Okay. I know the numbers. What did you say the positives were? Well, my positives were urobilinogen. They weren't positive. They were the three numbers. The specific I didn't have any positives. It's not negative. I forgot what the number was. When you do yours, you're going to have different positives. What? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the controls that she read off. So the oh. first two oh, okay. yeah, that's tell each did. other the time. Oh, I didn't put the retractor. Six. Yeah. yeah. These four all the way done before we move to the next four. But I don't. I want the person reading it to do all the writing of their own urine too, because that'll be good for you to get in the practice. Just go with whatever's closest on the glucose. I mean, if it doesn't match your color at all, put D and M. Does not match. Like my glucose was not the same, but I knew it was a blue to a green, and I knew it was negative on mine. It, the only put D and M if the color is completely matches nothing, right. and not even in the same family. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And you know, as a recommendation on this side of the room, I would do level three first to get the hang of it because you know it has no positives. Then both of you do your, then you have everything positive in level one. So this side of the room, you know your level three is all negative. You guys have it a little bit different because you have some positives on each control. So I'll write down what mine was so you can see. So when it's like it's the first one. The first two Oh, I wanted that. <laughs> Them before we do the patients. So we'll see if there's some uh, differences of opinion and we'll see if we can clarify those. But we'll get these four done before we do anything else. And if we run out of time, because we'll be done for sure by uh, quarter till at the latest, we'll at least do your own urine. We just add it to this first page. So we'll, I want you at least everybody to do their own urine. So then I'll swap and then do um, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, mine um, slid into the next one too. Oh, Yeah. I'll try and keep them all flat this time. numbers if you get anything positive I want the number from the bottle not plus two plus three plus four plus yep <laughs> and if you can hold it just straight up the bottle and not have to keep turning it I know our chem strips well we don't use them for manual we just mainly use those at six for the machine but they all seem to have that maybe my so don't don't do that two-minute thing before it's time. The leukocytes is very important 
to make sure it stays negative the whole two minutes. <laughs> control on your positives because that's what Barb said she liked about the MAS controls because each one you get a few positive and it's a little easier than negative one well that's always going to be yep that's a positive and so she thought those were better because there's a couple positives on each one so when we, like for the blood, when you write the positive, you just want positive, nope. you want the small, the moderate, okay. And if it gives a number, if it only says small, moderate, large, then put that. But if it gives you a number, like protein says 100 or 30, put that. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to just say positive, you want to know the degree. Especially protein. They're not going to worry if it's a trace or a one plus. They'll worry if it's two plus or more. Yeah. Do we do ours now? Uh, you got to uh, swap with the, room the room table room. Oh <laughs> When you're done with your two, you okay, want to swap okay, no, okay, with so your counterparts. I didn't see this. Because you want all four, and then we're gonna we'll we'll gonna end with the refractometers the on the controls before we move to any yeah. patients. Okay. It just it was just slight. Now, when you get the second yeah. two, no. I want you to I try to do kinda, them totally on your not. own you can and see the, if you can handle it. Like Level one, one is the hardest because that has so many positives on the coach. And what we can do is we get uh, some good urines that show color distinct. We can take a picture and I can always try to upload it too. Um, if we get like a good clarity where we can distinctly see the clear, hazy, cloudy turbid. I think we might have a couple turbids out there. Usually there, that, now that looks to me, can you put your hand behind it and see through it still? That might be a good cloudy. Turbid, usually you cannot see. See if you can read any of that bottle or any, yeah, the black lettering. Not quite. Not really. Because when you can't see through it, that's when you go through turbid. And normally that is not pathological. It's just change temperature. So be, when, especially when you do your patients, we're going to look Mix them well and look if you can Go see ahead. writing. Yeah, the same machine okay. here as the one at Oh, no, that's what you're They have an iris. They have the automated. Uh, that does there. it all. Now I'm not sure. They just have it's like a little smaller and you just put the stick on and you like 